If you look at a product inside any company, right? If you were to approach it from an academic level, there should be zero open issues on GitHub about it. It should be perfect before you launch it. And theoretically, you should have product market fit, right? <laughs> if you think about it from like a product first thought perspective, as soon as you have like a MVP, you try to find people who test it. It's okay if it has bugs. It's okay if you don't have PMF as soon as you launch it, right? So that's it. Things mm -hmm. differ so much, right? Felt I was late uh, when PyTorch 0.4 had come out. For some people, it felt late when TensorFlow had come out. People, it was late when word 2 ec had come out. It feels late now. I don't think it's ever late. Fundamental of having a job is being able to add value to some person that pays you money mm -hmm. in exchange for it. Figure out where you can provide that value. Traditionally, learning machine learning would mean A, you spend time learning the math, uh, mm -hmm. B, you spend time learning PyTorch, and when you start with PyTorch, you end up learning Pandas, NumPy, all that. C, it could be doing Kaggle competitions, but mm. uh, largely there's no three parts. None of these three parts exist for LLMs, right? If you ask the fundamental questions, why is this a hot topic? Uh, it's because to some degree, everyone around the world sees a lot of value in them. Why do they see this value? How can you hack this value and how can you figure out if you can provide it better than others can? So how do you learn that, right? You learn that by trying to build on top of them. So that's why I like said this earlier, right? Like if you live on the API layer, All right, there we go. Welcome to episode 10 of the AI Portfolio Podcast, a place to get to learn from experts and companies building great products with machine learning. Today we have Sayam Bhutani. He's a senior data scientist at H2O.AI, a Kaga Grandmaster, host of the Chai Time Data Science Show or podcast, and an international fellow of Fast AI. Uh, today I hope to showcase that persistence in your career can lead to uh, many different great outcomes. Uh, Siam, welcome to and excited to have you on the show. Siam. Thanks, thanks, Mark. Uh, very grateful <laughs> to be here. Uh, you introduced uh, your podcast as hosting experts or leaders. Uh, I was like, why am I on here? But still, still grateful to be here. Thanks, thanks for having me. You know, this is a common line that I'm seeing from different uh, folks that I've considered experts. They're like, why am I here? What are you doing? <laughs> I, I'm not an expert. Uh, when I talk to. Um, I think Radek was telling me something very similar. He was like, hey, I'm just a hardworking person that, you know, is just doing machine learning. So, uh, I mean, I'm not that even you... that, so. <laughs> oh, this shows off that great, a great start. Um, so I wanted to, to kick us off. I've been following your journey for a while. And I love that, one, you're very consistent with your content. Two, you also put out great content. And three, you highlight a lot of other great people who put out content. So that, that's the last part I, I find even most beautiful. Uh, so you recently went on a spree of digesting large language model papers uh, voraciously. And I think you call it uh, 200 days of LLMs. And then you published your findings. Well, what would you say are three interesting things that you learned from, from that whole exploration? That's a great question. I have to think about that. But... Um... Yeah, so like for context for the audience, it's, uh, all of these like goals I set in public start randomly, uh, which is to the point where I find something mildly curious and I decide, all right, this is interesting enough for me to pursue now, like uh, let me make me unlazy enough to pursue it. So I think of a goal and then I double it so that then I'm scared enough to pursue it. So I thought, all right, mm. uh, what if I write about one paper every week? That seemed feasible. I thought, like, what's unfeasible? How about one paper a day? How would I do that for at least three months? And that ended up being six months. But that's how it mm. started. That's how it went on. Um, all that was to buy me time to think about what I've learned, which I still no, can't it, think of. No, it's so good. <laughs> we, we, I could can, I can cash that question because I, I like to... I think when I interview people now, instead of asking, hey, what's your journey? So and so, I actually wanted to give the audience something uh, up front, but one of the topics that came up a lot was fine tuning. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd seen you had posted a ton of stuff on fine tuning. You recently uh, published a cool blog post. I think you were testing a bunch of different GPUs to see which precision um, led to the best performance. Can you tell us about that experiment and what led you to do that? Yeah, sure. Uh, let me just answer your previous question. I just have okay. some broad uh, notes. I think uh, broadly, 
there's been like a bias right like you don't really need to read papers or what not and my focus was mainly papers and this came from like an understanding of the fact that whenever you would read like blogs from let's say a16z or somewhere like that they would have this leverage and you can tell like you're missing from in between the lines right like they're telling you mm-hmm. some things that click with you which aren't obvious but then there's like stuff missing from your knowledge and now if you read blogs from vcs or leaders you can see that it maps to the conversations happening on twitter or uh, x or linkedin right like which is like what us commoners who don't have millions to invest in companies are also talking about and ho- don't have that leverage of speaking to like 20 companies building in a day mm-hmm. so i thought all right like what's the best way for me to learn that ended up being reading papers so that that was like the consistent um, knowledge for me which was the fact of being humble enough to like keep up with this stuff uh, on mm-hmm. the daily but then also know that it's like moving at such a pace that it will be outdated very fast and the learnings were uh, i think mainly about just understanding these common lines between different papers and also accepting the fact that this field is moving really fast why why the vc thing what what piqued your interest about uh, the vc thing cuz i'm i'm also curious i'm i'm very interested in in vc activity and all the hot startups but i want to know why what interests you about that field uh nothing in particular i'm not like uh, been curious about vc so to say but at that point uh, so this this analysis is in is in retrospect right at that point you always like when you're starting out in a new topic you want to reach or read from trusted sources hmm at that point who are the trusted sources right like these anon accounts on x like sure like now now it are some of them maybe or it could be anderson horowitz it could be uh, i'm forgetting the name but you could see all of these companies that you sort of associate some value with and they were writing these posts and then they were like random medium posts with like some some knowledge some noise so that's why i resorted to vcs and then in retrospect i connect the fact that hey like there's not much knowledge gap there right nathan are you familiar with uh, nathan and i how do i say i don't know how to say him he's you probably say oh, mark you butchered my name but um Yeah, he's a very interesting person in the space and I I loved his journey from the perspective of he he took a technical first approach to his education about the VC landscape of different startups and I I found that to be one quite illuminating and two extremely strategic in, in I think how he would have attracted some of the best startups to towards his thing so I I thought that was quite quite nice. Um any other investors that you watch based in, with that same type of profile? Um none that come to mind immediately but like uh, my read, my reading or any learning is always from the fact that uh, go to like trusted resources first mm-hmm, and start from mm-hmm. there. So it's it's all over the place and it's more about like not remembering these names but when you see them on your feed you immediately associate the account the icon with the value, right? My, my my like my respect comes from that uh, that mapping so to speak understood so when you you did this challenge you're like okay i i want to double this challenge so that you're scared to do it are you intentionally trying to fail in front of people what what's the where where is that line sort of drawn for you as you set this goal i'm trying to find out where the line is right Uh, mm. and this this is not just for this goal it's it's true for anything i like try to set in public uh for example midway through the year uh i think this was 22 uh i realized i didn't spend time on kaggle so i said mm. all right i have like 4 months and if i don't spend whatever amount of time i said i'll spend i'll give away all my gpus <laughs> so <laughs> barely barely just managed that number uh, became a kaggle master in competition Oh, okay. I I don't know if I want to do that to, to give him my GPUs, but that's <laughs> I I do admire that, right? So you you really put yourself under under the gun to get this thing done or else. Um that's extremely admi- admirable. Coming back to the fine tuning question on that challenge that you did. So it also seems that you have this 
exploration first way of learning to a degree? Uh, what did you learn of in, in that fine-tuning experiment? Yeah, uh, thanks for also keeping up with my nonsense. Um, <laughs> so at H2, we've created this awesome tool. Uh, I'm, I'm a part of the team here at the Grandmaster team. In H2, we can talk about that later. Uh, we've open sourced this tool called LLM Studio, which makes mm. it sort of fun and super easy to fine tune uh, large language models of any sizes. And it's it's GPU agnostic, uh, it's machine agnostic. So I'm not mm. like cribbing about PEFT <laughs> libraries, uh, different arguments that vary across hugging faces to PEFT's libraries. So my idea was uh, when I got this Christmas gift <laughs> from my friends, to compare these GPUs and see uh, what's the main difference between int4, int8, and fp16 uh, backbones for speeds and also if I can spot any other differences. So I was just curious. And uh, you would expect the latest uh, device to be the fastest. That's obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, the more expensive one to be slightly faster. That's also obvious. What I found interesting was. Because when you're switching to int4 or int8, you're quantizing and dequantizing the model on the fly, right? Mm. Because of that, the slowdown makes it slow enough to make FP16 the fastest. I would have expected int4 to be the fastest, right? Like that's the smallest size, fits in the RAM, VRAM. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That would be the fastest. Uh, there are presentations from NVIDIA about saying how fast it is now. That's not the case. FP16 was the fastest in all of my experiments across all uh, cards, hmm. effectively. Then there's int4 and then there's int8. So mm -hmm. I would have thought if it's FP16, then int8 and int4. That's not the case. It'll be faster, yeah. Huh. FP16, int4, and int8. <laughs> and this is single GPU, yeah? I uh, ended models up, running. I ended up also testing two 3090s at the end just to make it fair mm. to the 48 gig cards. So this sure. was across 6,000 ADA, A6,000, 13090, and 2,390. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I have to bring that, that data back to the team. Um, <laughs> and and the, the live quantizing and dequantizing, is that, is that normal to live quantize and dequantize? Yeah, because when data comes in, yeah, I'm confused there. Even I wasn't sure. And then I was discussing with someone uh, who actually pointed me to the fact that this is happening because of it. So I, I also need to look uh, deeper mm. into it. But that's my understanding right now. Fantastic. And then I think my next goal is to get you access to an FP8 machine because we need to know like FP8 versus FP16 versus Int8 versus Int4. Because uh, I've been doing uh, some work with FP8 on the inference side recently. So for those that are listening, if you're not familiar with FP8, Int8, uh, just to clue you in, these are the precisions with which math, math is executed inside of all the deep learning models and transformer models that uh, give us all the wonderful text that we use uh, on a daily basis. I, also, uh, also at a fundamental <laughs> level, these were invented because uh, of the GPU pool, right? So how do you create more GPU without spending more money? You, you make the model smaller. How do you make the model smaller? You go from higher precision to lower precision. So if you're giving mm -hmm. something double the space to store, you like shrink its space. It's like stuffing your clothes into your bag when you're going on like an international flight. So that's what you do when you go from FP16 to Int8. Roughly you, you lose half the precision and then you do some more to Int4. I think the most stable version is 3.15 Int. Uh, which mm. isn't implemented anywhere, but that's the precision that Tim Detmer had shown is like the most effective. I see. So you had mentioned you work on the Kaga Grandmaster team at H2O.ai. Uh, I find that very fascinating that in these businesses, there's a Kaga Grandmaster team. So that's, first of all, kudos to you for being on that team. Uh, what's it like to be on a team of Kaga Grandmasters and you get paid <laughs> to, to be that person? Yeah, very grateful uh, to be a part of this team. Uh, it's it's of course the best in the world, right? Like, and mm -hmm. there's no debate to it because it's it's measured objectively. And obviously, we have like multiple people who've been rank one, uh, many who are in top ten, many who still rank one currently at the company. Mm -hmm. So you, when you walk into a meeting, I'm speaking from my perspective. I know that I'm the like dumbest person in that meeting room, right? <laughs> so it's 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 obvious. There's no question in my mind and. 
from from that perspective it's like it's a great learning experience right like anything you hear uh, in a call you're absorbing it uh, mm-hmm. you you're there to like purely learn from these people how h2 as an organization functions is it's it's a uh, product driven driven first and we have this slogan called makers going to make so it's maker first uh, where the idea is to enable makers to make more products uh, make more mm. things by themselves and then empower them hmm that's a beautiful it must be a lot of fun is philip singer still number 1 so far i think so yeah okay yeah he's a he's a cool guy i met him a couple of years ago he gave a talk at a virtual southern data science conference so i was definitely grateful that you know <laughs> he acknowledged my message i was like oh the guy responded i was like oh wow <laughs> um that was an interesting time So coming back to your challenge do you recommend others try a challenge like this now and what what has it done to your so now you've gone through 200 days of actively pushing absorbing research mm-hmm. um, how does how does reading a new paper feel to you now actually answer that one for us still as bad <laughs> <laughs> still not any easier um hmm. i don't know it's it's like uh it's not the hardest challenge i've done uh, hmm. i don't think it will be the hardest challenge that i'll do uh, so for okay. for me it's just like i would have still done it if not publicly mm. so i still do such things but it's again like uh, being more accountable in public helps i think it's it's good for areas where like open source is very strong right so it could be any domain that you care about Uh, and if if you're engaged in the open source community like I am, and I didn't get into it, but that's also part of my role at H2, right? To build the mm-hmm. open source community, to also engage with customers. If you're a part of that, it sort of helps professionally also, right? And also, if your passion projects lie in those domains. Yeah, this is very much in line with um. I met Peter Beal once. Mm-hmm. I had a nice you know walk and and coffee with him, mm-hmm. and I was like, well, you know what? What's the secret to becoming Peter Abiel? He was like, every morning you read three papers. First thing that you do, <laughs> and he's like, I'm like okay, three papers every morning. Still fail at it every, almost every day. So, but I at least remember him in the back of my mind screaming, three papers a day. Um, but I thought that was that that your your challenge reminded me of that. To be honest, no, it's uh, it's insulting to Peter to be compared to him. <laughs> so I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, I'm I'm loving this episode. Uh, what was the hardest topic you had to learn? Actually, if we look at your whole journey, I guess everything is harder, right? Like, so looking forward, everything I like try to look at harder stuff. Mm-hmm. In that sense, anything that's next on my list would be harder. Interesting. Um, okay. But definitely, LLMs are sort of an interesting space, right? Because there's no one to teach you about this right now maybe maybe there's some some resources but like if you want to be at the cutting is there's no one to teach you which is always true for anything right and whenever i've been putting out content it's right around the cutting edge of stuff so top solutions of kaggle papers that came out less than a week ago recently uh interviews about stuff achievements that just happened like days ago Hmm. So in that sense like covering that is also hard right like because how do you validate those ideas like for example the thing we just discussed right dequantizing and quantizing i'm not sure if i like that's right or not so in that sense it's it's always risky right because mm-hmm. you don't, don't you really know something. the answers yeah huh when you're in your meetings with all the kaga grandmasters are you afraid to ask stupid questions i am but i've gotten comfortable with it and i'm grateful that you know like they still listen every time for some reason to anything <laughs> i ask like i was asking something stupid about batch sizes yesterday uh to max uh, who's also on the kaggle team and yeah he he told me look it it was obvious it was a dumb question but he still like walked me through it it's really nice yeah i you know from a learning perspective i think that's always the hardest part as you you really push and you become let's say more more accomplished your ability to ask stupid questions just because of of sheer limited memory um i think becomes a lot harder and having a safe space so it's nice that you have a safe space to ask uh, silly questions and you know 
still maintain face <laughs> when you go to work i mean i have no doubt that i am the dumbest person there right for me it's easier to not like mm. blow that mm. bar by any any means <laughs> so it's okay for me to ask anything right in that sense hmm. so i guess there is an advantage to aligning maybe to our identity you just you never feel bad you're just like okay cool this is <laughs> i like this yeah um, but it's also like the podcast uh, sort of made me okay with uh, Hmm. I I guess any question is fine as long as it comes with some sincerity that's that's one thing I've learned generally Ooh. if if questions are sincere uh, it's okay as as dumb as it gets oh that's, that's a beautiful distinction I, I like that a lot I'm just going to say I have a sincere question for you <laughs> <laughs> next time <laughs> so when folks start to go learn about LLMs um here's something I personally think I've run into is that uh, depending on your learning style or your curiosity level Um a lot of tutorials cover the abstraction libraries. Oh, I use hugging face. Oh, I do parameter efficient fine tuning. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing this thing versus really going under the hood and understanding exactly um what's happening. Uh just so that uh, at least for me you really appreciate what the library is doing versus just I'm um, calling some APIs. What's your best advice for for what places have you seen where you can go learn sort of the internals? of LLM so you appreciate why these libraries exist I even I haven't done that properly so like my approach mm. has been like a uh, builder first or at least aspiring to be builder first in the sense Okay I know ma- a lot of the value lies on top of the LLM layer so where the API connects to the LLM or the RAC system and the apps you build on top So I think most of the people would also lie in that area because uh not all of us or especially people who like uh, build websites build products not many lie in like the compute domain uh, which is where like a lot of us machine learning people come from mm-hmm. so my my advice would be figure out what's missing in that area right like this there's, there's so many good businesses that have come out of is like for example tome is a really good app and you can think of many such similar examples So I would personally start there and then figure out like how to improve all of this because mm-hmm. even all of these best practices are moving so fast right like right now it's skill or a I don't see it changing but who knows maybe we figure out there's a better fine tuning approach than just using lora and understanding it thoroughly could take at least a month maybe more for me it will take 3 months so if i spend that time and it changes like that, then <laughs> then what do i do with that time right yeah, it's interesting that you bring this up because i found myself you know trying to read the papers on the science qlora things like uh, i was reading the other night multi query attention so you're looking at okay why are all these advancements coming out and then i, I had this epiphany i'm like wait i'm not the one coding cuda kernels and putting these optimizations in production i work with those teams right and I, i get to understand okay this is what they're doing I was like, "Oh, why don't I switch my objective function to I can understand something if I can build a product with it. Hmm. Not like do a tutorial. If I can build a product with it, I really understand this thing. At least from a value perspective because uh, at least for me now um I think as you get older, you realize one your energy is going down, two your time is going down, and and three like your bank account to some degree doesn't rise. Maybe as fast. You hope that it rises really fast, but uh, and you try to optimize for one to grow really big and um, save time. So that's my new experiment now is to to try to build products just on the side, and you you're just kind of really stretching your mind to see as you as you are saying here are the gaps in the content and here are the gaps in the learning, but here's the the true bridge to the real world. So I like that you um you articulated that. It's it's. I think it's okay about uh, having these black box abstractions, right? Like to some degree, I let's say would know how Lora fine tuning works. You have this smaller matrix that sort of plugs into a larger matrix, and it's sort of a short circuit path that guides the learning. That's all I know. Like if you ask me a level deeper into it, I wouldn't know. But I'm okay with like knowing that much, and yeah, like at a fundamental level, I'm okay with that. abstraction and then i can go about my business 
but it's also about like focusing what you enjoy first right like and i think for mm. both of us like product first thinking to some extent uh <laughs> Yeah, this is an unwiring. So when you get a PhD, you did you do your PhD? I don't think you did your PhD. <laughs> I only done a bachelor's and I only have okay. a degree. I don't think I studied there. Okay, good. That's that's a good thing. I I think only select people should should really go after a PhD. Um, and I think one of the things that conditions your mind is that uh, you sort of get brainwashed that if you don't really understand the internals, like you really don't know this thing. So so you probably shouldn't use it. And I think that was my. My challenge in the fast AI course, it it really flipped that whole paradigm on its head. Like, hey, you don't need to know this; just use it. Like, no, I need to go understand everything, and I I think I put way too much, what you call it, um, undue stress on myself. Even now, like looking at at Qlora, exactly what's happening in Qlora. Do I really understand when I call this API? Uh, what's happening? Um, so I'm learning to relax that a little bit these days. So. <laughs> Did, did you hard. do a PhD? I did. I did. Yeah, I didn't yeah, know yeah. that. I, I don't like school, to be honest. I okay. I stumbled upon machine learning. I was fortunate enough to have a very um, kind advisor who just recognized I had one skill and I was working hard. It was not my technical ability. I didn't know how to code whatsoever. He's like, yeah, you're an idiot, but you work hard. So like, I'll listen to all your stupid questions. And, and that's how I was able to sort of learn machine learning and with much pain and angst. Um, so I, when, when I hear your persistence story, I truly resonate with it, right? Just because this was not my background and now I'm at NVIDIA and I, I get to work with the best people in the world. So I feel very fortunate um, and blessed. And even now I'm interviewing you. So for me, this is like, you know, extra layers of the reward of persistence versus maybe the academic, you know, things that you achieve along the way, if I could say that. It's always different optimization functions, right? Like so, academia awards different optimizations. Industry, op- like if you look at a product inside any company, right? If you were to approach it from an academic level, there would there should be zero open issues on GitHub about it internally or externally. It should be perfect before you launch it, and theoretically, you should have product market fit, right? <laughs> if you think about it from like a product first thought perspective as soon as you have like a mvp you try to find people who test it it's okay if it has bugs it's okay if you don't have pmf as soon as you launch it right so that's where things mm-hmm. differ so much right oh yeah, i like that i'm gonna put that at the front of the episode that was that was fun <laughs> Which which part of all of this LLM mechanics interests you more? Is this the training side or is it the inference side? I was I was actually curious about that. I'm yet to benchmark and play around with inference. That's actually just next on my to do. Mm-hmm. But I, mm-hmm. I, I I think I understand fine tuning more than uh, inference right now. Uh, okay. Generally, I'm like curious about it all. More curious about agents. And hmm. that's also a direction that OpenAI seems to be leaning into, right? Because, and uh, I was just thinking about it, although like there's no point in me asking the question, but will AGI be a LLM or will it be an agent? Sounds like it should be an agent, right? That's running in the wild. Hmm. So is, is an agent synonymous with the concept of function calling? Function calling being able to do something? The I, Yes. Yes, that's that's like one mm. of the large enablers of agents. But the idea is like it, it runs in the wild, right? And it has an objective function that it's trying to solve. But you don't have any supervision over it. With LLMs, it's more interactive. But with agents like, hey, go book me a flight. And then it understands, let's say, your preferences, uh, where you're trying to go to where by looking at your calendar. And let's say what airlines you prefer over the other ones. And mm-hmm. then it books that by itself. I see. What what's your favorite agent sort that you would want to create or have or, or interact with? The one I just described that would be cool to have. The travel have to book a lot yeah. of flights. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. But like the coolest demo I've seen uh, of agents was the Simulacra uh, paper, where you have these like twenty five agents living like in a simulation. 
<laughs> that was the coolest demo i've seen and anything from there was like yeah it's it's a variation of it's not as inspiring but that was even though it had its gaps mhm but that was really cool to see hmm i don't know I what's my... what's the implication of that <laughs> but yeah <laughs> sorry no no it's good i i think the agent that i want to see at least from a voice l11 perspective is a shit talk agent the one that could kind of like shit talk in like caribbean language or or you know i i have some african friends and they're mm-hmm. hilarious and and just just shit talk with me all different levels and like i don't know tell me stupid things all they just to entertain me um i'm i'm really interested as to i think a lot of optimization is going into the bounding the llm so that they safe and they don't say certain things and i think right outside the fringe there's this yeah. space of you know how humans really interact with you know yes we're saying the bad things but we don't mean bad things but it's just funny and that that extra funny llm space i'm very curious about um, yeah so or, come, or yeah would you rather let the llm do the work and would you rather shit talk so you leave the shit talking to humans and you leave the work to llm Yeah, I I I don't know. I think life yeah. is life is short and it, it could be funny and look at us, you know. I think the true banter in this conversation we were not recorded but have a different depth and if we had known each other for years. So I think as um like even as we discuss things, as you discuss an idea, if you maybe sit down and watch two venture capitalists talk about a deal, there's just a ton of cursing in that discourse. So there's there's like ways that business is done in the real let's just focus on business there's true ways that business gets done in the real world yeah. and it involves very foul language <laughs> so i wonder if agents will actually learn that to be effective um because there's an alignment there as well people feel very comfortable when they can express that and and you trust that person and you know there's no ill intent um so that that trust layer in the language the bad language i, I think is a very interesting thing from an exploration perspective <clears throat> um let's see oh here's a here's a good one why so i think we've been talking about the the internals of llms versus mm-hmm. using the apis and it, it what's your best recommendation is a best recommendation for you as an as an individual um but you interact with the open source community what's your best advice to someone um as they go out to learn Yeah learning learning here is different right like uh, traditionally learning machine learning would mean a you spend time learning the math uh, mm-hmm. b you spend time learning pytorch and when you start with pytorch you end up learning pandas numpy all that all that c it could be doing kaggle competitions but mm. uh, largely there's no three paths none of these three paths exist for llms right so If you ask the fundamental questions, why is this a hot topic? Uh, it's because, to some degree, everyone around the world sees a lot of value in them. Mm-hmm. Why do they see this value? How can you hack this value, and how can you figure out if you can provide it better than others can? So, how do you learn that? Right, you learn that by trying to build on top of them. So that's why I like said this earlier, right? Like, if you live on the API layer, mm. so. I think both of us agree we're like pro open source versus pro closed source but that's mm-hmm, true to many mm-hmm. people and there's yet to uh, there's like a flip that's yet to happen at least according to us optimists right like where we get to comparable levels of closed source across all benchmarks or whatever so how do you like stay on that limit and you know like where the open source models are better or comparable to closed source in terms of the value you provide for different problems different domains why is that important that's important because these models are very costly to infer right and if you can have a smaller model that you host it will be much cheaper mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just knowing all of these facts just like uh having hosted these models just for fun or for whatever reason seeing how they scale maybe it's unlikely but maybe you can come up with a better pricing than replicate for a certain application or other vendors if you can you'd like at the scale of millions it's 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 millions in profit right at yes. least thousands 
so these are different tangents i think that anyone can explore i'm curious about them all uh, mm-hmm. but i'm at mm-hmm. like right at the beginning of all of them so yes i would like to explore all of these directions i i, I think it's better to explore all of these directions rather than read any paper see any blog uh, see any of my stuff or anyone's for that matter uh, because at the end of it it's like what's what's the end goal right so if someone listens to this they might be incentivized to read a lot of papers don't do that i i did that because i wanted to see like what are the best techniques right and mm-hmm. i learned some sure uh, but you would learn more by building so now yes. we're at the point where the papers are sort of saturated and i think I, i i got lucky with the timing which was may last year when i started reading papers where you like hard papers that were like sure similar enough but there was some variation where you could learn something from all of them i think most of them have been discussed and implemented in various formats now i definitely got four so you're doing it by the way <laughs> I I I I'm I'm very curious to see how much other people had FOMO. I'm like this man is reading so many papers. I'm I'm wasting my time. I'm not gaining knowledge. So I I want you to know that at least in my mind you caused a stir to push me to to pay attention to a lot of that work more. So I thought that was that was interesting. Um just from the perspective of I don't think I would have pushed as hard without seeing your example of how hard you were pushing to deepen your knowledge. <laughs> thanks thanks for that but i think like the the idea of me doing that exercise was also that others don't have to do it right like mm, if you point. looked at good the point. summaries i was providing at least if you look at like the ones i eventually settled on the idea was i give you all you want to know about this paper and then you don't have to read it and yep. i think it's 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 true to a lot of the papers most of them can be summarized in a tweet <laughs> most of them mm-hmm. can be summarized Ooh. in a long length post Where you don't have to read it. Has anyone come up with an open source LLM trained on all of the papers, so you could just ask the papers questions? You know, everyone like puts out newsletters of summaries, but like, is there LLM we could just go ask about all the papers? I don't think so. I saw, um, I saw James Brick was trying to build something like that. Mm. but i'm not sure if he went on that tangent again uh, it's it's one of those things right like that seem easy but are they really because you only know what you know right and then to ask mm-hmm. these questions the model needs to be, seem needs to be knowledgeable enough in ml then ai then best practices so here's the thing you you mentioned uh, this term the gpu poor is is a very interesting term um so most people actually don't have access to more than one gpu right so what what have you seen now that you have multiple gpus what what are things that you've been able to do given that you've had more than one gpu is actually very curious i'm not the best person to ask because i like haven't tested that limit properly okay. um i've had these systems for a while uh, but then my focus shifted to reading papers and doing mm-hmm. what not no or is there So I don't know, but like the idea of having more than one GPU is to like be able to experiment more. And the reason why I built this system was when I would kaggle, I would always hit that mm. bottleneck. So at least in that perspective, it was better to have the like multiple yes. cards. Um, I don't think I've like hit the point where like the investment has a good mm. return. But then if you think about it, right, like it's it's. I would prefer this over than renting it during every competition. Especially now, it's obvious that uh, yeah, there's like limitations. You can't find instances and mm. what not. Oh, that's a good point. But even when that's yeah, and even when you don't have that bottleneck, right? You would like if you're renting in the bottle in the back of your head, you're like always thinking of how much am mm. I paying. So if I leave this on overnight and like an experiment finishes just before I go to sleep, I'm I don't care, right? Like it's the, the power usage goes down. Even if it does not, yeah. I don't care. But if you're renting, then you're stressing out, right? Like if you leave it on for a week, let's say you provision one for a month, and then you're concerned about like I'm wasting mm-hmm. a week. Do you think that affects your learning? Here, I'm in process as well. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. so. Because then you only want to run experiments there, right? 
it's 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 more of an incentive how to maximize uh, value there and here it's an incentive to maximize mm-hmm. learning so i think it's true to anyone but the idea there is to shut down the instance as soon as possible and the idea if you have them locally is to keep them up as long as yes. possible so whenever it's not running you'd ideally want to put experiments mm-hmm. on there and if you're renting you want to take experiments off of it as soon as possible that yeah it's an interesting duality almost that that it lives in um yeah cuz i interact with a lot of teams at companies and okay the big name companies they're okay with cuz most of them are in the cloud so when a data scientist wants to come and learn it it's that same thing that you're talking about oh i'm procuring this hardware my boss is going to be what what are you using this for and i think it really cuz it it does take time for you to understand what can i do with this hardware and getting libraries to work installing and there's all this sometimes thrashing for you to to get very comfortable so it's interesting that um you you say that as well so it sounds like having a gpu locally gives you that comfort to explore and, and learn to a deeper level yeah i think i have definitely gone overboard you don't need such large investments um but having at least 13090 one mm-hmm. is 6000 uh, is is a good idea if, if you want to mess around with llms what's uh, the, the faq is what's a good gpu to have if you're in llms at least at least 24 yeah. gigs right mm-hmm. so it, it at least that at least yeah, i think the a6000s are, are a great um sort of entry point because you get the 48 gigs and and for me the what i've learned the top data scientists in the world what separates them from the rest is access to compute because all of these large models that aside from the calculus right i'm i'm talking about like folks that work in nvidia folks that work in meta you know what i mean I like yeah yeah <laughs> so not not the top calculus that's a different i think domain but in the llm space the top data scientists have access to compute and they understand these mechanics of doing distributed training which i do think is a skill and that's one of the reasons i i decided to you know continue staying at nvidia um just because like it's the best place in the world to learn the skill of distributed training because not many people get that ability and i'm very curious as to what can be done on two gpus so we we know fairly decently what can happen on one but imagine everyone had two mm-hmm. gpus and and they got to do that kind of distributed training that gives them the ability to now maybe enter some of these companies to be proficient and go work on on larger scale um, endeavors so i've always mm-hmm. you know been curious and that's one of like my silent missions is to make gpus a lot easier to use so that um cuz i i come from the caribbean small small place and like there's not many people there using single even single gpus so if you're not even using a gpu a lot of real time applications of llms well fairly larger ones i i guess don't get to work so um, yeah the, the education part of it is is really important yeah i i relate to it it's it's true to india as well right uh, if you look outside the dev community and the thing i like about a6000s is uh, it's it's a blower gpu so it's it's like two slots mm-hmm. thin i'm working on an article of like advice of parts to get if you want a future or current multi gpu rig and you learn it either like the good way or the hard way that like the gamer cards mm-hmm. are very thick and those don't come now in blower style i think the 3090 was one of the last that came in mm-hmm. blower design and maybe after that like the power uh, i'd be curious to learn from the engineers at nvidia if like the circuitry limits it to that because i know like 4090s eat up to like 400 mm-hmm. 500 watts so maybe because of that we don't get blower cards but for better or worse like the good thing is a6000s are very thin and you can stack them very close to each other so you don't have to risk like pcie extenders dangling your cards inside your rig and then eventually people say it doesn't eventually your cable would get tangled in them and then you then you stress out about a fan <laughs> breaking off a gpu it's it's, it's better to avoid yeah. all of that and uh, i i think a good alternate as reading up about it is like the recent a4500 which is the counterpart to 
a 4090 so i think that's a quad row counterpart with mm. 24 gigs of ram or 30 so i i think these are great for such experiments because whenever you build a local rig you also partly accept the contract of being a full time it <laughs> administrator <laughs> so, that's a very true point here you minimize mm-hmm. that pain that's excellent yeah the sometimes the installation process can be a pain just to get everything working and <laughs> always is always is yeah i i continuously tell folks who work like hey can we make this even easier and um it's you know it's a tough process cuz like the cooler library man if you see the amount of things that they put into that and how much work they've put in for so many years and what's very interesting is that we maintain such strong backwards compatibility that that just blows my mind um mm. especially across all the different all the different cards <laughs> it's 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 a hard problem i'm sure from the other end so, so i wanted to ask can you give us a highlight journey of how you got to h2 or ai and what's very interesting in that journey i'd love i'd love for you to maybe give us a snapshot of your mindset at these different points because i think that's also very important we see you now okay you're an established cargo grandmaster senior data scientist at h2o but along the way i'm i'm sure you had different mental framings like when you first started at cargo till then when you got good um yeah sure i i don't think i'm established in any way um but yeah so like it's it's a cool story of how i ended up at h2 i started uh, the podcast after i graduated because before that i was doing blog interviews and i figured podcasts mm. are easier because if you do blog interviews and for anyone that does that you usually send over a list of questions in a google doc and the other person mm. fills those out and i was i was grateful like i got some really great people to do that uh, interview ian goodfellow mm. francois chole many many grandmasters and the natural progression was a podcast uh, i was enjoying this i thought let's continue that so on the third episode uh, i had only done like three or four based on the third episode the ceo of our ceo at its two reached out and hired wow. me off of that he said uh, the idea was i want to interview grandmasters i have easier access and let's let's do that and then learn some things along the way at two so at that point i was trying to maximize my learning from grandmasters because i thought they're a really cool species uh, to learn from um yeah i think they uh, you think they're regular no, people they're no? i think they're different people. um i i agree um <laughs> and then i got interested in doing more knowledge sharing along the open source community so i started uh, learning how to stream learning how to teach stuff live so that's how i got my mm-hmm. previous role and i think i wanted to continue on that journey but like get a bigger picture view of how to build communities uh, how to engage with customers at different levels and at h2o we have many great customers across different industries coming back uh, now i'm getting to learn that but that's just me connecting these things in retrospect before that it was like i i don't know why am i doing a podcast like there's obviously no career tangent that comes mm-hmm. through it right and there's no obvious career tangent that comes through doing meetups online or in person or building discord servers with enons right it turns out it could be a skill mm-hmm. in retrospect to some yes. to some extent so it's interesting you bring you bring that up because uh, so sharing with you like by the end of this month i would technically have three podcasts so one one might think you know what's the benefit of this and i think that at least the benefit of this particular podcast i get to meet people such as yourself so the next time i see you like we've had an end up conversation so i i realized that when you are when you're not in an epicenter here's another interesting thing too like when you're not in an epicenter of tech like san francisco your network an an ability to understand you know really what's happening at the forefront of let's say ai or or tech is very limited and you're often limited to your geography so for me these are mechanisms to eliminate geography from my own um network building and and sort of value 
how should I describe this? My value map. So I, when I meet people, I always try to think about mm-hmm. what can I do to enhance either that person's career or what are they looking for? And that's been a big part of my success in getting to NVIDIA, all the, the random things that happen all along the way. So um, <clears throat> one interesting thing that you did mention is that you stopped doing the podcast. Can you share about why you... So at the end of it, I think you had over 140 episodes I was looking last night, at least on the sort of official series, not outside of all of the videos. Um, how did it feel to stop after 140 episodes? That's a good question. Like I, I can, I, I'll, I'll describe it in two ways. So like A, emotionally and B, uh, yeah. intellectually. The, the, and this is also something I'm trying to learn, right? Like how to be gracious when you fail or when you like uh, stop, how to like graciously mm-hmm. do that. So even when you say, even when I set goals, even when I pursue different things, how to graciously fail or graciously stop. Uh, and I think like maybe I did that, maybe I didn't because I never said I'm ending it, mm-hmm. although I did. So some some of like the listeners were upset that hey, what what happened to this guy? Did he disappear? Where is he? Because some people only knew me through the streams, mm-hmm. right? Like they only subscribed to that and they forgot there's like a person outside of that. But the idea was to like after having interviewed so many people, uh, I saw a saturation mm-hmm. come up. And I thought it's it's a good time to stop now. And I've so emotionally, it felt like all right. I've met as many people as mm-hmm. I wanted to, more much more than I possibly could have in my head. And I don't want to waste their time. It felt like mm-hmm. I was wasting their time asking the same questions because to take Philip Singer, I had him on the podcast oh, nine wow. times. <laughs> okay, that's a lot. And <laughs> he he said he'll come back. I'm like why <laughs> why. <laughs> So out of the 140, like 114th of the podcast are <laughs> his, right? And I think like there's only so many questions mm-hmm, I could have mm-hmm. asked. So I went into it as a fresh grad, which means my knowledge doing it was also limited, right? At some level. I think it's always this growth. So emotionally, I felt I don't know enough to ask the right questions mm-hmm. to these people. So it's time yes. to know more. That was the emotional aspect. The intellectual aspect was uh all right let's let's test other areas let's let's see what other mm-hmm. things i can learn and this this feels like something i could do uh i am still quite comfortable doing these things uh let's say i test we do a lot of conferences a lot of meetups and the skill i've learned is uh being spontaneous yes. with it so if, if if i'm to interview someone i'd still do the research uh, and I'm grateful you've, you've clearly done a lot of research. You wasted your time <laughs> following up my stuff. But um, oh, I'm comfortable doing that mm-hmm. spontaneously. And that for me was a skill that I learned very, uh, very mm. much the hard way. So it's very interesting that you bring this up. So I'm what, 12 episodes in. And <clears throat> I, there's, a, there's a quote that says... Um, an expanded mind can never return to its original position or original size. And I think what I've experienced is that when I go do research, I'm, I'm hitting a saturation point in like, because I've listened to all my episodes. I'm the one asking all the questions. So I, I know how much they repeat to a degree. They're yes. like, okay, everybody's heard this thing. Like, why would they care to hear it from somebody else? And I, I would admit this is definitely a challenge that I think I'm, sort of experiencing that's why i started the episode let's let's talk about something technical because at least to a degree that that anchors into something unique to that person if if they are technical or for instance like you i think there are different paths that we could go down um but it's nice that you said that and to be honest it is very hard to quit so that sign i have that picture i have behind there um i I really got in with the anon so i tried to become a a YouTube NFT influencer, and that was probably one of the biggest mistakes of my life. Um, you learn, you learn very quickly that you're not with the hip crowd, like all the high schoolers uh, pushing NFTs. And I'd done the YouTube channel, I was on Discord, like I'd done a bunch of things. Um, and then 
people had to gracefully just say, hey, my technical skills will pay off way more in the end than trading a couple of pictures. Mm -hmm. Um, So for me, that was a very tough decision. But where I am now, I'm like, okay, this is this is a a good thing. And then even keeping the podcast in check now, where you do kind of over index on you focus on building it initially. So it it does in I what I'm experiencing, it does suck some wind out of your technical sales as you um, maybe were pushing in that direction. Mm-hmm. So I'm happy that uh, you shared honestly. Um, that's why you had quit on some of the emotions that you experienced. <clears throat> it's it's hard, right? Like, I, I didn't have a balance. So I, with any goal, I said I'll do two interviews mm-hmm. every week for a year. And uh, it's, it's hard uh, to schedule these, uh, especially who I was and the kind of profiles I was reaching out to, it was hard to figure out the schedules mm-hmm. correctly in the speed that I could have two interviews rolling out every week. So I did that for one year. Wow. I actually did that. I said I'll put out two interviews every week and I did that. So I was also like, I wouldn't say burned out because I thoroughly enjoyed it. But then that was a large majority of my every day or my free but time definitely a duty at some point versus a joy it sounded like it was still joyful um the idea was can i like if i take this time back and reinvest it somewhere else are there better mm-hmm. things to learn mm-hmm. uh, yeah um so given that you did 140 interviews and you're like okay i've i've asked the same questions over and over what are some things that really stuck out to you after you've interviewed a lot of these folks, right? So Jeremy Howard interviewed you, and I always thought that was um, quite a beautiful thing that, you know, he's such a, a highlight in the industry, and you know, he really takes the time to speak to speak with all of us. I think. So what was that? I, I guess let's start there. What was that interview like, and what was that experience like for you? It speaks more about mm-hmm. him than it does about mm-hmm. me, right? Yeah, that's that's all I have to say. Like, there's, there's no reason he had to do it. Obviously, there was no, nothing he gained from it. It was all to mm. my benefit. So, he says he's this selfless yes. teacher, right? For the world. Yeah, and I think he did get something from it, to be honest. Because when you're a, a true teacher and you see someone really accelerate, it does, in my opinion, I think, fill your heart with great joy to see that, wow all of this effort that I put in and look at what this person has accomplished. So, you know, kudos to you for taking a lot of his lessons, like Radek has taken his lessons. Um, there's so many people that he's impacted with that course. So it's beautiful to see um, the fruit of his and, and, and Rachel's work. No, I mean, to, to be fair, I'm not the best of the fast year alum, okay. alumni, right? Like there's, there's people who like achieve way more like people who are at OpenAI, mm. people who are at pretty much all of the fan companies, a lot of the leading research labs, people who built and sold companies, who built multi-million dollar companies, uh, have become Kaggle Grandmasters, have become multi-category Kaggle Grandmasters, who started from zero in that way. So I'm, I'm pretty much at the bottom <laughs> of the list, right? Like in that I, I'm seeing you're trying to paint this as a common thread throughout everything. You're at the bottom of the list. Uh, and i think it's true right i'm just kidding um what do you think separates the top data scientists from the top highly skilled data scientists from from the rest for me uh seeing these people i create uh on different Mm. problems it's confusing how much time they spend on doing the simple stuff Although I'm sure they've done it like thousands Mm. of times. So when they're starting on the smallest version of the problem or just starting out, it's jarring how slow they are and how thorough they are with the fundamentals. So just, I I think it's, it's just being humble and approaching every problem with some humbleness. Although like I have been close friends with many of the grandmasters now and when they're creating the first baseline or 
when they exp- when all of us started experimenting with llms like even just talking to the model just like simple prompting it's it's confusing how much time they would spend there right like for me all right one prompt works i sent two examples that two shot prompting this is done but like they they, they would spend a large amount of time mm. doing such things that's fascinating i i would not have thought that that would have been um your answer so that that's good to know so so they do hold on to those fundamentals and they practice it's almost like a what you call it like a samurai they, they really take their time in their craft yes Mm. Um, what advice do you have for folks that want to start a podcast so I, I think to some degree not everyone wants to do it um, but I think when you see someone doing it and you have that in your heart or in your mind for a while you're just curious about hey what if I did do it and I think I'm personally in, in that phase right now I'm, I'm doing it so I'm, mm-hmm. I'm still feeling the curiosity uh, what what advice do you have for folks who want to start a podcast? Um, I can speak about what worked well for me in retrospect, right? So I never actually built out a proper website, mm. uh, never did all the conventional things that I should have to like reach a bigger audience. Okay. Um, I had hit like 1 million reads on my blog before I started the podcast, which gave me confidence that all right, I could get at least 100 listeners, Mm -hmm. let's say. And I thought when I actually started the podcast, I didn't connect my blog audience to the podcast because I wanted to like uh, grow it from zero and enjoy Mm -hmm. that experience. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I've like left a lot of the conventional wisdom out, which is that I didn't create the like gossip clips out of it partly because i didn't have the energy left and partly because i didn't want to do it uh i didn't have a website i didn't have like a proper branding what i did focus on was uh making sure every episode is first of all very valuable Mm -hmm. to the person Mm -hmm. coming on it and then b to the audience so i always thought of like long-term value and People still know me as the chai guy, even two years after I stopped <laughs> the podcast, right? And I think that's like some measure of success of the podcast in the sense I wanted to create long-term value. And in like a field of AI where things move so fast, people still recognize me for a thing I'd done like two, three, mm-hmm. four years mm-hmm. ago. Like my episode with Jeremy aired out four years ago at this point, five years ago, and people still know wow. me for that. So I. When doing any interview, when doing any podcast, the idea was to ask any, all the questions shouldn't have been asked to the guest before. Mm-hmm. On you made this podcast. very hard, by the way, because like you, you did quite a good job. So I, I do go look at other people's interviews and see what questions they asked. And then the more popular they are, they're like, wow, the space of questions is just getting slimmer and slimmer and slimmer. Um, so it's an interesting problem to, <laughs> to solve when you're doing research on someone. Hmm. Yeah, it was fun for sure. Um, okay, so podcast, podcast aside, uh, there were obvious benefits in your own networking in your career. You you got it, it seems highlighted for a job uh, at H two O AI. Um, you're a top Kaggler, one of the top Kagglers in the world. What what other advice do you have for folks who they may not have stature on Kaggle? Right, they may have gone through fast AI. They didn't, I would say, excel crazily at fast AI, um, but they still want to find, you know, break into data science or find that next upper role. Any any insight for them there? Yeah, yeah. First of all, I'm not a top Kaggler. I think I'm, I'm like there's there's like categories left to right on Kaggle. I'm like good on yeah. the right one, and the more you move on okay. the left, it's okay. harder. That's a good distinction. I think I, I think I get recognition on Kaggle even as a discussion grandmaster because people liked hmm. the interviews. Mm-hmm. So that's why uh, I get the recognition. But I would say the common thread of all of my nonsense has been like pursuing okay. a passion. So people say that you need ten thousand hours to be good at something. Can you put ten thousand hours into that thing? Is is the question mm-hmm. you should be asking mm-hmm. yourself. So 
can i enjoy reading 10000 papers of llms do i do will i enjoy this topic so much if not should i be pursuing mm. it can i do 100 plus interviews and like have the same sincerity have like the same enthusiasm with every episode uh if not should i yeah. be doing that and now now with like this this channel uh, that i'm trying to do now with like llms all, all of those mm. things so. so that's a new hypothesis can you this is sort of a new passion thread you you're pushing down correct i think it's always mm. been that uh just like pursuing something that i don't care about the hours i would end up putting yeah. into it the hours become irrelevant uh, because it's 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 like school right in that sense like if if you remember the harder subjects at least for me i'll i'll speak about my experience the harder subjects i would like instantly fall asleep reading those before mm-hmm. an exam the ones i didn't like like it'll, it'll make me uh, sleepy it'll make me disinterested i'll be like i'd had like one finger at the end of the chapter so just so i know how like how far away am i from like from flipping those pages and then i'd flip ahead of time just to see how many images are there so in my head i'd like extract that from the number of pages that's a clear sign i don't like it right like and and then it's like if if i like the subject i like i would have studied it way ahead of mm. the exam that's a good that's a good distinction <laughs> i think um have you read the book so good they can't ignore you be so good they can't ignore okay. no i'm not no i i'm aware yeah, of so it I, I'm you know if you ever get around to reading it would love your opinion on it because it really shifted my mind to um doing something you don't like for a very long time so i so for instance like myself so the other podcast that i told you I was starting is called progress guaranteed so i'm very curious as to like if you ask me what i would do all day it's like why why are people successful what why are they able to push themselves to these different uh, limits so your your own public goal setting was very you know i was very curious about that like how could you set so many things and actively go after them and in that um you sort of learn that people sort of fall in love with something once they've gotten good at it so there's a threshold of i'm not good at it i don't really like it but somehow they stick with it and then once they become really good with it they start to maybe fall in love with it some more um cuz during my phd i'm just like i don't like this what the hell am i doing but now i'm like hey i get paid really well i interact with great people and it's a unbounded domain in terms of stretching my mind um mm-hmm. and so i that's how i've ended up landing on machine learning as a i would say as a pseudo pseudo passion <laughs> I I would somewhat okay. disagree with that advice right in the sense that if you're very new to something and like for me I got into this field at like the start of my career at like this the end of my teens and at that point you really don't at, at least I didn't really have a personality I didn't have a mindset whatever and if you were to tell me to like pursue something I didn't mm-hmm. like in the present with the hope that in the future it might pay off it will just make me miserable yep. <laughs> i think yep so i wouldn't have sustained it i think or i would have been like very miserable oh, i was miserable <laughs> but for me this was an you didn't really have much of a choice so at least where i grew up in trinidad you know for me it was not an option to stay there because there was not the mechanisms of i think But she career I think in the US is a very unique place where you can really get rewarded for your efforts. Mm-hmm. Um so for me that was a goal and that that was my driving force to kind of push through all of it. So I do align with you like if I didn't have that constraint <laughs> if I was in America like an American I would have never gone to school. I would have never touched. I probably wouldn't even do high school. I would probably just go straight into doing something cuz me and school like I would go to school with pillows. Literally I would walk to school with a pillow, sit in class and sleep. um and then my phd i would sleep under my yeah. desk that's how my advisor knew me as well so um so it's you know but we have to do what we have to do and and i think a lot of people fall into that position where um life circumstances don't give them the mechanism to sometimes pursue the thing that they yes. love um so what could i was yeah go ahead. but no 
knowing what you know now about mm-hmm. the field if you get like 10 seconds of interaction with yourself in the past you would not ask yourself to pursue uh academic path right like you would, you would sort of say do a builder first path right Maybe. oh yeah 100 Because 100% like, 100% um yeah. although although i must say there's something that happens to you in a phd uh i think if done right when i say right meaning like old school tradition it's not very a nice it's not a nice process like it's meant to be very um challenging and your advisors mm-hmm. are meant to be like they almost make fun of you and most people wouldn't necessarily like this i i had a very safe environment where my advisor would like i would come tell him something and he's like i don't understand a word you just said i don't know what you're saying just just leave and it's that constant testing of your ability and then when you come to mm-hmm. your your defense and then your proposal these people flip on you like this whole time they were like helping you to research and all of a sudden they're like what garbage is this you brought to me and you i literally spent the last three years working with the guy on this thing he's like what garbage is this i'm like what do you mean he's like what the hell is this so you really learn an independent persistent effort because when you do go out there and you present your work especially in academia there is no one who attacks your work like another academic they they are vicious um mm. more so than i think business people <laughs> to be honest and um so that's the one thing i i did sort of take away and in addition i um, mean if you have a good advisor they truly force you to pay attention to an insane level of detail so those are the two mm. skills that i really took away was one doing something i don't like because i think that is also a skill and i mm. i translate that to working out for instance like i hate working out i have a six pack but i hate working out um so there's this antagonistic relationship that i have with things that i should be doing um so but to answer that question i would not i'm grateful i did my phd i'm happy that the doors that are is open for me because it does you know in, in the current system it does open a ton of doors yep yeah um but for anyone else thinking of doing it you know go work for a top startup you'll learn uh, insanely more you'll get rewarded it'll be hard either path is hard um yeah uh, nothing against phd's but i um, like like you said right like choose yeah. your hard yeah that's i i like that i like that choose your hard um <clears throat> okay here's so the, there's a in machine learning there's the objective function right so we're trying to minimize error and we have different constraints with which we minimize error what is your career optimization function is it wealth is it interesting things what do you what do you optimize for optimize for Ooh, fun okay optimize okay. for fun uh in fact this this became a chant uh, at like i think the last mm-hmm, meetup mm-hmm. i was at because after any meetup uh, if it goes well people usually surround yes. you with questions and it just so happened to be a student meetup so everyone was obviously asking for career advice and i just kept saying optimize mm-hmm. for fun and then at the end of it like midway through it you had this crowd that was done and they were still hanging out and the newcomers so with me the like people who had al- already answered everyone would chant optimize for fun <laughs> to like these questions so i, I think optimize nice. for fun and i think i'm learning that now as i i get a space to explore kind of what i want i'm like okay i can make 100 200k more in this place but am i going to have fun is this going to be stimulating am i learning um so that uh, happy you said something like that yeah i mean why do we remember song lyrics from like a song 10 years ago versus we forget something we were working on one week hmm. ago right like why why is that fun. because at, at some some intellectual level it was more yes. engaging more more fun that's a that's a great that's a great point uh what are some things you do every day to ensure that you make progress I don't think I make <laughs> progress every day or attempt let's, let's go with the attempt honestly uh try to be more productive mm-hmm. in the day so not looking at your phone or email or slack goes mm-hmm. a really long way uh, for really me hard. at least as soon as i wake up for like the first two three hours very very hard <laughs> i tried um 
Not, not. No, I was gonna say. Yeah, I, have you ever tried no social media before five pm? I did hmm. for a month. Um, that's hard, but I, I think now it's just like avoiding feeds, social mm-hmm. feeds, or emails or Slack for like the first three hours of the day and front loading the cognitive yep. work there mm-hmm. sort of helps. It's not possible uh, all the time. Something I ideally want to Perfect. do every day. Yeah. So as we get a little closer, uh, so the landscape of jobs and careers is rapidly changing, and I think it'll rapidly change over the next five years. Um, <clears throat> how would you now approach the market as an early professional? So you're fairly established in your career at this point, and you you're still growing a lot, um, but you're starting out today. How would you optimize? Besides for having fun, by the way, like that one's very well noted. Yeah. Um, I'd follow the same path, mm. right? So, fields evolve fast. Uh, AI field evolves fast. It felt I was late uh, when Python zero point four had come out. For some people, it felt late when TensorFlow had come out. Um, for some people, it was late when Virtuic had come out. For some, it feels late now. I don't think it's ever late. Uh, the fundamental of having a job is being able to provide value to some person that pays you money in exchange mm-hmm, for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, to figure out where you can provide that value uh, while enjoying that. And in what area do you want to provide that value? Very broad advice, oh, no. but yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd approach That's that. That's going on the front of the episode. I, I enjoy that. And so one <laughs> secret thing most people will know, uh, if they reach the last end of the episode, they'll know. Um, one of the reasons I do this is to be inspired by the people that I interview. And this is why I ask some of these questions, just because when you, you see someone achieve certain things, you know it's hard. You know it's not easy. You know it sucks sometimes. And to see people actually put in the effort and go through it and achieve it, um, I get a lot of joy out of you know just hearing someone mm-hmm. um, not give you the tricks, but uh, tell you how it is. Okay, so last last couple of questions. Uh, what three books do you recommend folks read if you're a reader? It could be any, any from any topic that resonate with you. Um, Subtle Art of Not Giving mm-hmm. a Fuck by Mark mm-hmm. Mason was really good. I really like that. Um, Zero to One also had a large mm-hmm. impact mm-hmm. on me. And there's no third. I think these are the two books I reread oh, every year. Interesting. Okay, um, I'm going to I'm going to index on that. Um, so you're a big rereader of books as well. Not generally, but these are the two books okay. I reread. And did you see? Did you see and feel different things each time you reread it? I think so. I think so. It's like it it uh, indexes on the feelings or intellectual ideas floating in my mm-hmm. head at that mm-hmm. point. So that's also a mark of good books. It's like every time you revisit, you learn something. Perfect. <clears throat> so I, uh, we asked a lot of advice in there. So here's an interesting question. Uh, you're stuck on an island with a specialized chef and you could only have two meals, but the chef could cook anything that you want. What two meals would you choose? Mm-hmm. You're going to be stuck on this island for a long time. I Generally, I'm like... Uh, I, I, I am a foodie, but uh, when I'm in work mode, I really don't okay, care. Okay, that's interesting. Hmm. Most of my days, I eat my food standing up close to the stove because <laughs> I want to minimize like the time eating. Yeah, I can't, I'd like, if I'm productive that day, I can't sit wow, down and eat. Okay. So those days, I don't care what I'm eating. Hmm. And if I'm on like a vacation, I, I think I'd like, or for like the most expensive, most fanciest of foods. Okay. So, so it's sounding like one super fancy meal and then one meal for while you're productive in a day. That person just gives you food to <laughs> give you sustenance to keep coding. No, for me, there's no <laughs> middle. Like if if I'm working, like it's it's like, I don't care. Like just feed me anything. Like just make the <laughs> hunger go away. I don't care. I like I probably don't even register mm. the taste. In such in such days. Oh, that's a cool answer. Um, what's one thing that brings you joy? Uh, 
Chai. Chai. Yeah. Well, you know, Chai is interesting. Well, I didn't get as interested in Chai until I saw your show. And then you had mentioned that your mom makes okay. you Chai anymore. I'm like, I would love my mom to make me Chai anymore. Because growing up in Trinidad, like we just didn't have Chai tea. That was not a thing. So um, mm-hmm. like for me, that's like a delicacy every time I drink Chai tea. And I think about you. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, when I say chai, it's, it's uh, and when any Indian usually says chai, it refers to Indian mm. masala chai, mm. which uh, is different from green tea, white tea, black tea, and especially chai tea. Chai tea is the closest to it, but ever so different. Okay. Uh, so my last question um, is not meant um, from a famous perspective, meaning so it's what do you want people to remember about you? But I'll caveat the question from the perspective of um, it, it's not about being famous, but it's more about Long term, what would you optimize for? I don't know, just like uh, when you think of names, right? You register mm. emotions also, right? Like, I like this guy, he's fun. I like this guy, he's evil. <laughs> he like, he seems nice to me, but generally, he's evil. I don't know, like being remembered as like a fun person who had like mm-hmm. good fun things. That's beautiful. Well, I think it's very evident in this episode. I've been laughing a lot. So clearly you're bringing a vibe of fun. And, um, you know, I wanted to thank you. That's good <laughs> yeah. to know. I wanted to thank you for your time and, you know, just coming on the podcast and, and sharing your insights. No, uh, again, thanks. Thanks for having me really. I could, I could tell you've done a lot of work. Uh, I don't know why, but thanks, thanks uh, that you did. And thanks for having me. Very grateful to be here. Fantastic. All right. See you.